Okay, so today we are going to talk about volcanoes. And um, there's a couple of things we do with uh, when we talk about volcanoes. Uh, we talk about volcanoes, obviously. Um, but we also have a, uh, a video that we watch about uh, Mount St. Helens. And um, I bounce around as to which I do first. Um, and uh, maybe this semester I'll, I'll mix things up even more and, and do the video in the middle. We'll see. We'll see what Thursday brings. But um, bless you. for now, uh, we're going to start with a little bit of lecture, a little bit of introduction. So we're going to, you can have many, 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 many lists of things. Three things that do this, three things that do that. And for some reason, there are always threes as well. Um, but we're going to start nice and simple, very generic. And we're going to say that, um, generally speaking, there are three things that come out of a volcano. Uh, lava, a pyroclastic material, and gases. Now, we used to sort of play this as a, a guessing game, for lack of a better word. I say, okay, tell me something that comes out of a volcano. And yeah, everyone would say lava. Um, some people, eventually, we'd get to ash, right? Uh, we'd hear smoke uh, and maybe poison gas. And somebody might say, oh, those big hunks of flaming rock that I see in the, in the Hollywood movies. And all of those things fit into these three categories. Lava is, well, lava. Um, pyroclast, pyroclastic material, that is anything from big flaming hunks of rock to ash. Pyro, fire, clast, rock fragment. Um, when we get to sedimentary rocks, you'll hear the word clast again. It's like a rock shard. But we had that pyro to it. It makes a very, very special kind of rock shard. And then the smoke and the poison gases and, and, and whatnot, well, that falls under. Both of those fall under gases. Because the smoke, as you'll hear soon, um, is really just a whole lot of water vapor which is definitely a guess. So we're going to spend some time talking about each of these three things uh, over the course of this lecture. We're also going to, I believe, next, yeah, talk about the three types of volcanoes. All right. So remember I told you, lots of lists of three. So the balance of the, uh, the presentation, we'll be talking about essentially that first slide. Um, but before we could do that, we want to introduce just a little bit um, about three different ways that volcanoes can uh, manifest themselves at the surface of the Earth. Now, I don't want you to copy down all this stuff that's on the slide here. It's, it is, you know, some of it's important, some of it not so much. Uh, what's much more important at this point are the, uh, is the um, shape of the cone, the shape of the volcano itself. Embedded in that, along with that, we want to look at those scale bars, because these are not to scale in this drawing, not to scale at all. Because it would have you think that, uh, without looking at the numbers, that the top one is the smallest, right? And. Uh, the bottom one is, is arguably the largest. Tough call, but that one in the middle looks a little smaller, I think. All right. But if you actually look at the scale bar, we go from the biggest, the smallest drawing is actually the biggest, upwards of 10 kilometers high. Sorry, it's in that big. Down to the smallest, which they put in the middle. And then the bottom one, who has the biggest picture, is doesn't even approach half the size 
of the top one. Arguably, uh, it spends a lot of time being about a third of the size. So why did they put them in this order? Well, because the last one is a combination of the two. So they have to talk about that one last, but they could have done a little more to, to, to work on the scaling here. So our three types of volcanoes, our three types of cones that we're going to talk about are shield, as you know, like a Roman shield or a Viking shield, a cinder with a C, and then a composite. When you were little and you got pictures taken at school and you get a nice little cute picture of yourself and then you have your whole class picture, that class picture is, is sometimes called a composite. It's a whole bunch of things brought together. So, uh, as I said, the uh, top one here, this shield volcano, um, is the biggest of these guys. These are your volcanic islands, for the most part. Uh, anyone had the opportunity to go to Hawaii? Yeah. yeah. Super high, impressive mountain? A little bit, yeah? Okay. Um, you know, there's some. Okay, and people look at it and they say, oh, wow, you know, where's the volcano? Well, you're on the volcano. I've not been there myself. I, I simply get to, to talk about it. Um, but... Uh, I've seen pictures. Right? Uh, so it, it's not necessarily one of those peaks or one of those mountains that's a volcano. It certainly may have a, a eruptive activity. But the whole island is the volcano. And, and that's the part that, that folks sometimes miss. And they say, oh, well, there's sea level. Here's the, the shoreline. And I see there's a high peak or two there. But no, the whole thing. And all the way down to the ocean floor. And then you're also thinking, okay, well, I've been offshore. It's, you know, ankle deep and it's waist deep. Well, keep going. Keep going. And if you had one of those deep sea diver suits on and you kept walking until you get down to the ocean floor, you'd be a good bit down there. These are big, big, big things. All right. Um, but we only see, kind of like that old saying about the iceberg, you only see the tip of the island, the tip of the volcano. They call these um, shield cones or shield volcanoes um, because of the material that they're made out of lends itself to forming very sort of wide, low angle, what do you think of a trash can lid, okay, um, mountains. It is lava flows, and they're not horribly uh, eruptive. They're not those explosive, nasty, Again, Hollywood kind of eruptions. Uh, heck, um, Hawaii has been in the news, you know, over the last couple of years for their eruptions. And, and don't get me wrong, certainly, you know, loss of life, loss of, of property, you know, a lot of devastation. But the whole damn island didn't blow up. Okay, that there's some cases when that happens. So it was horrific. Please don't get me wrong. But uh, as you'll see in some of our images. You know that the the lava flows are quite different. Um, so it, is, it, it, for lack of a better word, it sort of bubbles up out of the central uh, the vent, okay, and and rolls off to the side. And in this slow, gradual process over thousands and thousands and thousands of years, builds up this not very steep but very broad based volcano. Now, cinder cones, on the other hand, cinder cones aren't typically made of lava. They're made of that pyroclastic material, that fire rock stuff we talked about. This is more like your 4th of July firework cone, okay? It's spitting stuff out left and right, pew, 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 and this stuff is, is piling up all around the, the vent in the center. It builds up very quickly, and it's quite sputtery and nasty. You don't want to be standing around one of these uh, while it's going off. Um, I imagine they don't get very big because they just tend to blow themselves up. All right. Um, le 
less than 300 meters. There's what, three feet to a meter, right? So you're looking at less than 900 feet. Um, that, you know, that's still an impressive size, don't get me wrong, but compared to these other guys, it's a hill. Um, so these are rather steep, um, and as I said, they build up rather quickly, and they oftentimes disappear just as quickly. I don't have a location for a cinder cone for you to think about. We had the Hawaiian Islands for, for uh, the shield volcano, but I don't really have one for cinder cones. They could more or less pop up anywhere, okay? Um, but the other two I am going to have you learn a location. So a composite. Composite's a mixture of the two. What are our two? Well, we've got this nice, gentle, flowing lava flows that build up a you know, bit of landscape, a broad base. And then we have these pyroclastic eruptions that are sputtery and spitty, and, and they build up pipe. And they're unpredictable and nasty. I made that part obvious. You put those two together and you get the west coast of North America. All right, we do have active volcanoes in North America. You just don't hear a whole heck of a lot about them. Uh, it's called the Cascade Range. You'll be hearing more about that. Uh, but you have heard of some of the mountains. Mount Rainier, for example. All right. Uh, growing up, people were still trying to climb that a whole lot, and there wasn't, you know, I don't want to say there wasn't a bunch of stuff in the news, but it, it certainly, you know, made the news more frequently. They're not so interested in mountain climbers anymore. Uh, it seems like everybody climbing mountains these days. But back in the 80s, you know, it was it was a slightly more uh, narrow sport, if you would. Um, so, and, and, and Mount Rainier, of course, is no slouch either. That's it's a it's a heck of a mountain. But, um, and you'll see some more of the names when we, when we show you an uh, image with the, the range there. But I sure as heck didn't know that this guy was trying to climb a volcano. They just kept talking about Mount Rainier, Mount Rainier, you know, West Coast, so on and so forth. It's a dang volcano. Now, mind you, it hadn't erupted in a hundred and some years, a couple hundred years. Um, nobody really thought about it. And then Mount St. Helens came along and uh, reminded everyone that there's volcanoes out there. So your composites are broad-based. They're unpredictable because you don't, they don't exactly alternate. It's not like it goes lava, pyroclast, lava, pyroclast, lava, pyroclast. But you don't, you don't really know what you're going to get. They're studying that kind of stuff to try and predict it. Okay. But it's, it's a mixture. And, and due to those two properties there between the lava and the pyroclast, it builds up a rather impressive structure. Rather impressive structure. These start on land. So again, they're going to look like these single isle, uh, monolith mountain kind of, of things. Mount Fuji, most people can conjure an image of that in their brain. That's one of these guys. Okay, all these famous mounts that you've heard of, Vesuvius and so on and so forth, that's these guys. Okay, because they're there in the middle of civilizations. We tend to build up our societies around them. Why? Well, because they have good soil. All right, uh, all those nutrients we just got done learning about minerals and you know that igneous rocks are made out of minerals and they're made out of elements. Soil's amazing. And they don't, you know, in handful of lifetimes typically they don't erupt that frequently. So we tend to build up around them. It's kind of like living, you know, down by the river because it was great for transportation and again good for soil. But it did flood. You know, we had to weigh these things out when we were setting up our civilizations. Anywho, so we've got three types of volcanoes, shield cone, cinder cone, composite cone. We've got locations for two of them. We've got the Hawaiian Islands for shield cones. We've got, at the very least, the west coast of North America for the composites, and then I rattled off a handful of others. 
you'll see some maps a little later. You'll, you'll, you'll recognize some names. Kilimanjaro is another one. Uh, we told you that the shield volcanoes are primarily uh, lavas, and we told you that cinders are pyroclastic material, and that the composites are a mixture of the both of those. I got one last thing that I want you to remember out of this slide. Lots of test questions out of this slide. Your shield volcanoes tend to be basaltic. Some of you have met basalt at this point in lab. Composites tend to be made of andesite. It's at the very last word on the bottom right hand corner of the slide there, super tiny print. A-N-D-E-S-I-T-E, andesite. And again, I'm not going to have you fuss about a rock type for cinder. It could be anything. Again, that, that we're not going to bother trying to memorize something about it if it can be anything. But most shield volcanoes are basaltic. Most composite volcanoes are andesitic. And again, those that have had lab already know that that's saying something about their chemistry. Saying something about the chemistry of the, the magma and the lava that makes up the volcano. All right, questions about the three types. Don't worry about um, angles of incline. Don't worry about ele uh, elevation, altitude, whatever you want to call it, height. Okay, but do remember, you know, who's the biggest and who's the the normalist, the smallest, so on and so forth. But don't. Awesome. Lava. Pretty, isn't it? Um, it has a photo credit, but it doesn't tell us where it is. Those of you that had lab yesterday, that's black. What is it probably? Ah, that'd be cool. Uh, but no, what's the other black fine grain lava that we saw? Basalt. Yeah, that's basalt, okay? That is basalt. The red stuff will cool to basalt. The red stuff is obviously uh, active lava, for lack of a better word. Um, but just, a, you know, an image of a real lava flow. Again, not something. You know, from a Hollywood movie where the geologist uh, is trying to drive across it or somebody's trying to walk across it to save their girlfriend or what is just a real image. Now, speaking of unreal for a moment, I've been, I've been using this slide forever. And one semester, I don't even know how long ago it was right now, somebody asked me about those two trees right there. And of course, they're, you know, I've, I've seen them, but I never really pondered it. They're like, how are those trees still there? And and I, that's a great question. They don't look very healthy, do they? Uh, but nonetheless, they are not totally burnt up either. Uh, I, I grew up watching Bugs Bunny, and, and one of the old gags in Bugs Bunny when somebody would get themselves blown up is that you know whoever would walk over and either touch them or go, and they would just go to cinder, you know, right straight to ashes. That could very likely be the case with these guys. Um, but, but more than likely what happened, you know, little by little, I don't say it's off to the side, but the, the image can suggest that it's at least up a little higher on a hill, that, um, you know, the lava, when it first hit it, it just wasn't that, that hot. It is lava, but relatively speaking, it wasn't that hot. And um, they sort of just got surrounded by some lava before they, you know, had an opportunity to get hit by something really, really hot. Um, so, you know, some cooler lava hit them first, sort of encased the base of them, for lack of a better word. I don't, I don't know. I'm just making up a story, but that is a, uh, possibly why this, the person even took this picture. I doubt D.A. Swanson's still around, but uh, you can ask him one of these days, maybe. So, lava. Again, going back to our discussion about igneous rocks. Um, if you're having this in earth science, you didn't have the discussion, so you'll be hearing this for the first time. 
Uh, but going back to our discussion in geology about igneous rocks, you remember that there are three kinds, three flavors of uh, lavas and magmas, right? Your, your felsic, your intermediate, your makeup, and those are chemistries. But when we're saying basaltic, that this is probably basalt, we're saying that we're over there looking at that mafic chemistry. Now, this one does not cross over into lab class. In, in lab, we worry about what's granite and what's basalt and so on and so forth. But what's great about these next two slides is that it reminds us, it reminds me even, that um, even within those, those rock names that we're learning, there are variations. How do you guys, how would you pronounce this word? What? I didn't hear you. Say it out loud. Pahoho. Pahoho. Pa that's exactly what it looks like, right? And that's exactly what I said for probably 15 years. And then I was showing a video one day, and they had this uh, scientist person there, and they were in Hawaii talking about Hawaiian lava flows, and he said, Pahoy hoy. And I'm like, oh. Now, mind you, that sounds possibly, if, if possible, that sounds sillier. But, um, yeah, it's probably right. So, pahoy hoy. Um, and uh, what that supposedly translates to is thin and ropey. Okay? Um, what we're looking at here in the, uh, the background of this image is how the top of this lava flow is all kind of gnarled up. Looks like old roots, right? Um, so, this is a rather fluid lava. Uh, your book is going to talk about uh, viscosity, right? I'll, I'll, I'll go into that word in a moment or two. But um, this is a very fluid lava, and uh, so it's, it's very runny. Think about uh, maple syrup, okay? Um, and you'll see a comparison in a, in a moment. So the top surface, which is exposed to the air, the atmosphere, it cools off rather quickly. That uh, red glow goes away, turns into the sort of starting to look like the rock stuff. Um, but underneath it's still warm, it's still flowing. So as the top sort of dries and the bottom is still flowing, it makes that cool pattern at the surface. By contrast, we've got ah, -ah. And uh, this is what I was talking about earlier. And uh, it's again, I've been given this conversation for a long, long, long time. And then a whole bunch of people got killed last year in Hawaii. Um, but do those guys look concerned? Not really, huh? Uh, in fact, the third guy ran to the truck to get the marshmallows. Okay, um, That lava flow isn't going anywhere anytime soon. Um, those plants, obviously in trouble. Uh, if somebody's house is you know, behind these guys, it, they're going to want to remove their possessions. But otherwise, you know, this is what I mean about it's a, a nice gentle sort of flow uh did you guys when you went to hawaii did you guys do any of those helicopter tours did they drop you down on the field or anything? I'm, I'm to okay okay yeah i mean not the safest place for a kid but they do allow it you know so and that's the thing they they would not let you do that stuff i'm sure there's ways this could be signed don't get me wrong but they wouldn't have these helicopter rides where they drop you down or even fly you over these things if if they were concerned about the eruptive nature, so to speak. I went to like the opening of the Yeah? And I saw it like uh, I don't know if I've seen the lava, but you can see the How field. old were you? Uh, I think I was like fourteen. Oh then you should definitely remember, yeah. yeah. So you didn't know if it was a what or a what? What did you say? You didn't know if you were looking at the you started saying I interrupted you. Oh, I was looking at like the opening of the volcano but um I don't know if it was the opening per se, but it was like where the lava had like reached the surface. Oh wow! Cool. And I, I couldn't. I don't think I saw the lava, but I saw the glow of it. You know, okay. Like, you know, oh, it was down like, deep, but you couldn't really. You didn't want to like hang over the edge and look well, at it. Oh, they had a round right there. <laughs> they didn't even round yeah. Yeah. So, uh, uh at any rate, um, this is much more. I, I gave you an example of say maple syrup for that for the Hawaii. Mm -hmm. This is much more like oatmeal. Okay, big thick oat stuff. Um, and th my point is, is that these are both basalts, okay? They're still basalt. 
And in lab, you've got one hunk of basalt that you look at. And that is what you leave the class thinking that basalt looks like. And for the most part, that's absolutely true. But don't you think if, it, if it's dried, solidified, and I don't know, I'm going to just go back for a minute. I intended to put pictures of rock coming up, and I don't remember if I did. But don't you think all that stuff would look different when it dries into a rock than, say, this stuff does, than, say, the one we've got in lab class? You know, just, just to use a word, you know, texturally, okay, you're going to see patterns, different stuff. Um, so, again, the, just the point is, is that, you know, on Hawaii, and I'm sure there's other gradations that they recognize, and this is just two that textbooks have, have uh, gleaned onto over the years, for hoi hoi and ah, uh, uh, I'm sure there's way more variation, right? Uh, and my, my point is, again, is that just, you know, that, that uniform hunk of, of fine-grained black rock that we see is really just sort of a stereotype, a, a snapshot of, of what basalt can be. I didn't put pictures in. I think I went searching uh, one semester for like a picture of hardened Pohoi Hoi and hardened Ah uh, Ah, uh, and I, I didn't come up with anything. So. All right, so switching gears again, uh, anatomy of a volcano. Um, you might want to draw like an upside down ice cream cone or something here. We're essentially drawing a little uh, volcano and labeling some parts on it. So, hold on, let me look. I thought I had a drawing here. I do not have a drawing here. Weird. Let me look for that real quick. I swear I added a. I doubt it got removed. No, don't have it there. Bear with me. That'll do. All right, so I'm going to search for a better one, but this will work for the moment. So as I said, you draw yourselves an upside-down ice cream cone, and um, we want to label some parts here. The, uh, the volcano itself, right, the mountain, whatever you want to refer to it as, uh, we call the cone, and you saw that shield cone, cinder cone, Composite cone, they tend to refer to it that way. So the, the mountain itself is, is the cone. Uh, down the center, we're going to have the uh, vent or the vent pipe. Now, as he inadvertently implied a couple minutes ago, there can be several outlets on any given volcano. Again, these things are, you know, huge, okay? Uh, especially when you're looking at the uh, shield ones, uh, when you're looking at an entire island. Um, but in our, you know, for educational purposes kind of drawing here, uh, we're just going to have a single mountain with a single vent pipe, okay? Uh, that vent pipe goes down underneath the volcano to a source of all that magma. All right, we're just going to call that quite simply a magma chamber. So you're going to draw a little pool. We don't have one here kind of drawing Peter's out right before there, but just draw sort of like a, a little thought bubble down there, a little pool, uh, and that's our magma chamber. So the magma chamber is filled with magma, it has a vent that leads up, and that vent leads all the way up to the tippy top of the volcano. And the name for that tippy top of the volcano, uh, once that point's gone, of course, is crater. So I'll take that ice cream cone and bite the tip off of it. 
I always used to do that. My parents would yell at me because, of course, the melted ice cream will then run out through the bottom, right? But there was just some something so alluring about biting the bottom of that ice cream cone every time. So the crater on top, and again, we'll see some real images here in a moment. All right, so we have crater, cone, vent, and magma chamber. We all have those labeled on our little 2D image there. Beautiful. Find my PowerPoint again. There we go. There's the button I'm looking for. All right. Oh, now we're in this mode. Okay. So, um, crater and caldera. So what we have here in the foreground, and you can even sort of see if you have a bit of imagination, uh, picture a funnel like in the top here. You could possibly even see that vent pipe down there uh, just peeking out a little bit in the image. The snow sort of gives way to the blackness there. And you can imagine that funnel and a little tube attached to it running down through the center of the volcano just like you were making your baking soda and vinegar volcano when you were a little kid for science fair. Yes, sometimes these are filled with bubbling, boiling, molten rock, and they throw rings or virgins or whatever over the side into them, and all those things, again, Hollywood has taught us. Uh, but more often than not, they look exactly like this. In the background, we've got the second vocabulary word here, and this is not really a part of a volcano, but it is a, a feature, a remnant, if you would, uh, to caldera. And um, caldera is this, this circular shaped um, impression there. Quite frequently they're filled with water, not always, but they do tend to make very nice lakes. Uh, these are what's left behind as the volcano um, in its last days of life sort of just blows itself to smithereens. Again, it doesn't always happen this way. It could just die out as a cold mountain. But sometimes they blow the heck out of themselves. And they crumble down and collapse. And as I said, over the years, they fill up with water. Why? Well, because they're low spots, right? And the thing about volcanoes is that sometimes even then they're not done. There's a very famous one, Crater Lake, you may have heard of it. Uh, that has a little volcano in the middle of it growing again in a thousand years or two or three well, It'll probably be bigger And so we'll have a volcano in the middle of the lake A big impressive volcano. We already have a tiny little volcano in the middle of the lake So caldera is a collapsed volcano and again in the image here we have a crater now case in point Kind of hard to judge scale on this map, um, on this image. You look off to the left there and you do see some features that look fairly far off and, and it's really tough to tell again, you know, how far away that caldera is from this cone, but more than likely these guys are sharing the same magma chamber. Okay, they're just, they're close enough where they're probably two manifestations of the same thing. Um, so again, the one in the background probably was there first, blew itself to smithereens, and instead of growing back up uh, in the lake itself, as I described to you, well this one, you know, came out, oh, we'll just say a mile or so away, uh, it popped up somewhere else, it was probably easier just to weasel through over there, um, you know, cracks in the earth or whatever, it was easier for it to come to the surface over here. But more than likely, as we said, the same source 
Because if you think about it, we don't really talk about it in here, but you know, how do you get that magma chamber in the first place? That had to have some sort of feeder to it, right? Um, and, uh, you know, Lord only knows how long it takes for that magma chamber to fill up. But, you know, it does its run of things, it empties, and it blows up. You know, like I said, the, the volcano over it could blow up or it could just die out. But sometime in the future, through that very same you know network that fed it in the first place, it certainly can get start getting filled up again. So uh, you know we tend to see volcanoes repeatedly in the same areas, but they're on a much different scale than we are, right? They it's just you know Mother Nature's not concerned with decades and even centuries, oftentimes. All right, so we talked about the Cascade Range. We're looking here at the west coast of North America. You see California on the bottom there, Oregon above it. If you're like me, your geography is not so great, perhaps. So Oregon is above California. Then it goes to Washington State. Then we have the Canadian border. You got British Columbia up there. So this chain runs all the way down the west coast there. Uh, California is not really known for their volcanoes. What are they known more so for? Earthquakes, yeah. All right. So a little further down here, this whatever thing is going on changes a little bit, and it manifests um, as earthquakes as opposed to uh, volcanic activity. So there's some familiar names. I already mentioned Mount Rainier, um, Mount Baker, Mount Hood. Some people know those. Uh, Crater Lake there in Oregon, that's a big caldera at the top of, still at the top of a mountain. Mount Shasta. Again, they don't make the news like they used to. Lots of people climbing lots of mountains these days. But uh, those were, Mount Hood's fairly famous. And every one of them a, a volcano. Now again, not necessarily active. And that's something I want to talk about just for a, a moment here. We have so many insides, it's hard to tell where the main road is, right? Um, you hear active volcano, you hear dormant, and, and you hear extinct, and your book's going to use them. But for exactly the reason, the, the groundwork I've been laying uh, for the last couple minutes about, you know, these things could always rebuild, and Mother Nature's on her own time frame. Okay, um, you know, these are in humanistic terms. Dormant simply means that it, it hasn't erupted in, you know, re rememberable history. A couple hundred years time. Active, you know, usually, well, it's actively erupting. Um, the Hawaiian Islands are, are active. Uh, Iceland, by the way, Iceland is a volcano. Iceland doesn't have volcanoes. Iceland is a volcano. All right, active. And a handful of others. It's a fairly regular basis. But extinct. Extinct's a big word, right? Especially, you know, with species, we know that what it means for sure. But to put that stamp on a volcano... I, I, I hesitate, you know, and, and, and not that I'm a volcanologist, I have any say over anything. I'm just saying, knowing, understanding what I do understand, you know, unless it looks like you're going to see some images of, of uh, volcano remnants in a minute or two, um, you know, I, I really wouldn't put that, that word on it. Uh, heck, it blows itself up to the smithereens, collapses down into a big hole, fills up with water, and it can still grow another volcano in the middle of it. That's kind of what I'm saying. So I don't use those terms very often, but you can't escape them when you're talking about volcanoes. So I just wanted to take a moment and address them. You will not see those as three vocabulary questions, for example, on the test. So why are they here? I'm going to come back to this slide in a moment. They're here because of plate foundries. All right, you guys have heard of plate tectonics. 
you know more or less what's going on with plate tectonics. A plate boundary is where one plate ends and another plate starts. It's a seam. All right. This picture shows us obviously something called the ring of fire. Well, based on this image, it looks more of like a horseshoe, but we'll assume there's something down along the bottom there. The Ring of Fire is the most volcanically active area in the world. It goes around the Pacific Ocean. We'll throw earthquakes in there too, most volcanically and earthquakably active, that is the conversation about volcanoes. So, um, And it marks essentially, as I said, the Pacific Plate boundary, where the Pacific Plate joins the North American Plate, the South American Plate, um, the uh, Eurasian plate. Uh, we're not really worried about the plates here, but you know, understand that there's plates at the other side. The Pacific Ocean is on its own plate. Now you get over the Pacific Islands over here. You see my own Tambora, Krakatoa, okay, uh, and up towards China and Japan. It's a mess over there. There's a bunch of little plates, and it is it is a mess. But otherwise, again, essentially the, the entire Pacific ocean is on its own plate. Uh, same can be said for North American plate. It goes from basically the west coast of North America all the way to the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. We mentioned that way back when, but just a quick reminder. So these plates are fairly large things, typically. So anyhow, uh, about the Cascades, all right, they're there because of a plate boundary, the plate boundary of the North American plate and the Pacific plate. Now, I want you to look at, as we're going to go back here for a second, they aren't on set boundary, arguably, right? They are inland, hundreds of miles. Well, what the heck? How could they be a function of that, but not really on that? Well, so this type of plate boundary is, uh, and I want you to write this word down, it's important, uh, subduction zone. Sub, S-U-B-D-U-C-T, subduction zone. Uh, subducting, subdue, something is losing in this battle. What's losing in the, play, the fight between the North American plate and the Pacific plate is the Pacific plate. All right, It gets subducted underneath the North American plate. Now, you folks at home are going to miss out on my awesome hand gestures here, but I'm going to show the folks here. I'm bringing my two hands together, like two plates meeting, right? And the one on, it'll be your guys' is right in the, in the, out there, it's my left hand, but you're right. It goes underneath, right? So at this point, my fingers from my right hand for you folks at home, on my left hand, sorry, are touching the knuckle uh, of my other hand, and my fingers from that hand are wiggling under the palm of my other hand. So you see where those fingers end? That's a good bit into that plate, isn't it? These things are not on the boundary. It's way down deep where that plate finally starts melting and, and, and deep down inside the earth, that stuff bubbles back up. It bubbles back up through the earth. So we see these guys inland, all right? Now let's add to that something else. Uh, in college, I was a fry cook, right? Um, so one of the things that you do, you've got your cool grill, and that's, you know, everyone loves doing the grill work, but you got that stupid fryer you got to deal with. Well, with fryers, you learn really quickly you don't want to put water anywhere near them. Boiling oil and, fi and, and water, not good. Hopefully you learn that in fire safety somewhere along the lines as well. You can if you've got a grease fire, you don't throw water on it, right? Well... It's also, uh, believe it or not, and they don't say don't throw ice cubes on a fire because nobody would do that, but it's actually worse if you have ice and, and hot oil because it goes from a different state of matter. There's a lot more energy in there, and it, it bubbles and crackles. And again, if you've ever worked a fryer, you know what I'm talking about. You take something right out of the freezer, all full of ice crystals, and you throw it in there, it bubbles like crazy. All that's going on. You're at the ocean. So down with that plate and all that molten rock, you've got a hell of a lot of water coming down. 
okay? And all that water is mixing in with this magma. There's actually another, I talk about these handful of things that are, for, that are semesters on their own, okay? Aqueous geochemistry is the name of that one, and I, I ran screaming for I did not want to take aqueous geochemistry. But they spend 14 weeks talking about how adding water into that molten magma changes stuff. And I'm sure if you care about that stuff, it's really neat. Okay, but I, I figured out enough of it, again, from working the fryer, that you, it's going to make things a mess. So again, not only do we have extra magma down there because that plate is melting, okay, but we've got all this water going straight to the, the gaseous stage filling it up with all this churning and bubbling and everything. And it's no wonder that stuff bubbles up at the back up into the continent, OK? So again, the reason it's inland is because this is a slope of the, the oceanic plate going down. It takes a while for it to get hot enough to melt. Uh, you've got all that water mixing in. And it just it doesn't happen on the border. We do see on some other places on plate boundaries, we certainly see activity right at the boundary. Uh, if you're familiar with the Aleutian Islands, you go from that spit of land between um, uh, Alaska and Russia, okay, uh, where there was the land bridge. Everyone knows about the land bridge when the water level was lower. Um, that is right on a plate boundary as well, okay? Uh, but that's a different one. The boundaries are pulling apart, and just like if you cut your arm, you know, the blood bubbles right up on the, on, the, on the line of the cut. Same thing's going on right there. Okay, so typically we do see the activity on the boundaries, but this subduction zone is, is special. And quite possibly why we have these composites here, the special kind. Remember, these are composite cones in the Cascade Range, the arguably the nastiest because they're big, they're unpredictable, and they're at the surface. And uh, as you see, many of these cities you recognize, especially up in Washington, we've just got all the major population centers right around these mountains. So Ring of Fire, again, is the um, around the Pacific Ocean. All right, It is the most uh, volcanically active area in the world. Um, and the Cascade Range is just one part of that. The second most active part is all the way over here, and it doesn't really, where's my mouse? <sighs> you guys see my mouse? There he's down there, okay. All right, so at least on the projector screen, I don't, still don't see it on my laptop, but over here in the Mediterranean, right? This is one of the reasons spelling doesn't count in my class. I, to this day, still can't spell Mediterranean. But uh, over here, we've got all of those um, village obliterating volcanoes of, of lore. If you read you know, your mythologies and whatnot, and you've heard of Vesuvius, Pompeii, Etna, all that stuff is over there. Um, so the circum uh, Mediterranean, I forgot to use the word circum with Pacific. Circum just means around. Circumscribed, circumcise. Okay, is, is, is around. Uh, so the Circum-Pacific Belt is the Ring of Fire. The Circum-Mediterranean Belt, that's our second most active area. And again, it's just about as big a mess as we have over um, at the uh, end of Asia there with all those little tiny plates and together. Um, so we see Vesuvius, Etna, oh, Thera. Yeah, I forgot about Thera. And again, all of these ones that you've even vaguely heard of, these, are, these tend to be your composites. These are the big mountains that people paint, that people climb, um, that we you know, worship, and, and so on and so forth, depending on where you are in culture and history. Uh, what else we got here? We got Kilimanjaro. You've heard of Kilimanjaro. Krakatoa, Fuji, Fuji Mount Fuji or Fujiyama, uh, Pinatubo. Probably haven't heard of Tambora on my own. Um, Mount Pele, okay, in the Caribbean. And then up in the very top corner, you've got, you've got Iceland. Now, of course, they've named their active peaks, but again, Iceland is essentially a volcano itself. There's volcanoes on, on Antarctica. You see one poking out down at the bottom there. 
So questions about Ring of Fire and or um, why we have volcanoes, where we have volcanoes. We're going to touch on that a little later again, but for the time being. All right. Things you can make out of lava. Um, I don't really have a better definite uh, subtitle than that, unfortunately. Um, but these are, these next handful of slides are essentially lava features, all right? Things that we see uh, in the rock record that are there because there were eruptions in the past. This one's great. Um, Columbia flood basalts. There are lots of flood basalts around the world. This one just happens to be in North America. Um, but they're all over the place. If, uh, they tend to call them tracks as well. If you studied uh, dinosaurs at all, especially like the demise of the dinosaurs, you may have heard of the pecan traps. That was a huge um, eruption over in, in Asia. Uh, around the time that the uh, dinosaurs were dying out and they were trying to pin for a while um, that on uh, the, you know, the dinos dying out. So there's, there's, there's this happens. It is a thing. Um, as it turns out, you don't always build volcanoes, big pointy mountains, uh, when the earth cracks open. Sometimes it just bleeds. And um, that's what I want you to picture here with these flood basalts, okay? It's a big crack in the earth, which again, is supposed to have a slide, um, but it doesn't, called fissure eruption. Fissure, F-I-S-S-U-R-E, fissure eruption. It's just again, a crack that just lava comes out of. It doesn't always have to build mountains. So what you've been staring at while I've been babbling here for the last couple minutes is all lava except for the water and the trees, of course. So from the very bottom of that waterfall and lower, which you can't see, all the way up and into the background and into those hills in the background, that's all lava. And as you can imagine, that took a very, very, very long time. Now, as it turns out, lava is one of the best things to date. Uh, when it comes to like attaching, you know, doing that um, radioactive uh, decay dating kind of thing that they like to do, lava is amazing because it, it it forms, it cools, it's done, and you get a date. Okay, um, some other rocks not so great. So I, I don't remember the dates on this, but they they can date it, so they know how long it took for this to form. And then you got to think about then all the carving back down through it again, how long that could have taken. That's a little harder to date. But at any rate, all of this lava. Now, add to that that this is covering uh, the better part of uh, three or four states. It's monstrous. Okay? And it was a period of time, you know, that you probably wouldn't have wanted to be out there. Around in Colorado and New Mexico and all of that. It was it was messy. And it just flowed and flowed and flowed. And what kind of rock did it make? Basalt. Good. Blood basalt. Alright. Alright. Uh, this one is lava dome. Lava dome. You would think a lava dome would be a good thing. Um, essentially, when the uh, top of the, the volcano, the crater, as it were, um, cools off, the pressure's gone, all right, um, it seals it up nice and tight. Yay, no more volcano. No, shaking a champagne bottle at this point. Okay. Um, lot, volcanoes have lots of gas. We, we mentioned gas very beginning, briefly in the beginning. We acknowledge that it's there. I talked about how, uh, just a couple minutes ago, how water uh, can get down at the plate boundaries, uh, and that bubbles up in the fryer, all that conversation. All right, 
this stuff is, is, is chock full of gas. You're going to see uh, pumice and scoria in lab. Those are frothy rocks because, because gas is escaping from those rocks. Um, so when you put a lid on a volcano and it grows organically out of the, the walls, crystal by crystal. Remember, in magma, lava cools into igneous rocks. So this lid literally grows in place. That sucker gets sealed up pretty tight. And then over the years, not you know necessarily a couple months later, not a, even a couple years later, but over time, that pressure can build back up and you could end up with one wicked nasty eruption. Uh, especially because of how well it, it, it seals itself in. Oftentimes, you'll find that the sides of the volcano, because they're more or less just piecemeal together, right? They're like particle board, eruption after eruption layered together. Um, that ends up being a weak spot, or weaker than the top at any rate. And that blows out, and then you get a, like a directional explosion, which can be pretty bad. Or, at the very least, the whole dang thing collapses down that way. And, and again, think about how close we put our cities to these things. I'm going to reference Lava Dome a little later when we get to uh, much closer to the end of the PowerPoint. These also have another nasty side effect. forever forgetting what time this class ends but you know, the teacher showed up and I was like oh my gosh I'm out of time I've got 10-15 minutes so columnar jointing what we're looking at are those hexagonal tile looking things and that lazy lazy geologist that couldn't be bothered to move their rock hammer right why is that rock hammer there? Other than maybe they forgot, but yeah, yeah, it's there for scale. It's there for scale. Now, to the average person, it might not be horribly helpful because not everyone knows how big a rock hammer is. But if you're a geologist, you know that that is an S wing, which is what all the cool guys have, right? And gals, all the cool kids have. Uh, you also know that by the amount of silver shown between the handle and the head there, that that's the small one, the normal one. So you know that that's about 14 inches long. So that's entirely there for scale. All right. We're famous for these, these horrible pictures. It's not like at the conferences they don't give you these cool little plastic rulers, okay, that are made exactly for this purpose, but nobody ever remembers to bring them. I've never seen one. In, well, I do. I have one picture that has the scale in, in it. Um, but otherwise, like all my pictures, because I don't carry my rock hammer anymore, all my pictures have my foot in it, okay? Which looks horrible, but they're not for, you know, public display. They're kind of like for me to remember. Oh, okay, this is that big. I know how big my foot is. You'll see lens caps, pencils. Pencils are tough. You know, again, you know how long a pencil is, but it's sometimes hard to tell exactly how long a pencil is. Um, once it's, you know, shortened. Um, lens caps, again, same idea. Coins, a lot of time, depending on what you're trying to measure. So these, these uh, hexagonal tile things aren't really tiles at all. They're the top of very tall um, columns, telephone poles picture um, of uh, rock. Mm, this is a side view. So that picture was taken at the top of these guys. And going back to my conversation about um, not wanting to use the words extinct, dormant, active, this is what they call a volcanic neck. So picture that volcano you drew, okay, on your paper a while back, and now you're underneath the ground and you're in that vent pipe before you get down to your uh, magma chamber. So you're in that, that underground there, you got this, this, this vent pipe, okay? 
and you drew, of course, because you had a tiny little picture, you drew a vent pipe that probably looked like a straw. Well, this is a realer life vent pipe. They're not just little water pipes, okay? They're monstrous. They can be at any rate. There's another one. Some of you are familiar with this one. I've been here. I don't know if this is my picture or not. I took a very similar one. Um, at Devil's Tower, which is legitimately the middle of nowhere. Everyone says middle of nowhere. This place was three hours from the nearest highway. It's a long side trip. But it was very cool to be able to see, nonetheless. So at the base of this, where all the touristy crap is, is a sign that shows um, that at the time this was a volcano, the land was up above the top of the tower now. So this is way down deep inside. Weathering and erosion over thousands and thousands of years. Um, igneous rock is very durable. You guys will learn that compared to sedimentary rock, sandstone, limestone, crap like that. Okay, um, That's like cork compared to, to this. So this thing stays. But once all that surrounding material is gone, it does start to peel apart um, somewhere between like a blooming onion and string cheese. I don't know, whichever works best for you. Okay, It just sort of peels apart. Self-peeling string cheese. And you get these cool little hexagonal columns. So columnar jointing, a joint is a crack in geology. Okay, A break in the rock. So um, it breaks into these, these cylindrical, hexagonal cylindrical um, pieces when it loses the su surrounding support structure to it. Tends to be basaltic, but again, volcanoes can be any flavor. And they're quite famous because they're so odd looking. Oh, so back to my extinct dormant. I, I would say, okay, yeah, we could call this guy extinct. It's, it's literally, you know, 100 feet below the surface of where it once was. It's falling apart. I'd be willing to put an extinct stamp on that guy. Lots of cool Native American stories about this one. I think a giant bear chased a chief to the top and all those the side is from the claw marks of the bear. Okay, neat stuff. Those are full-size trees in front of it. It's quite big. Uh, a student asked me about this one one semester. I, I had not heard about it. Um, here in the, uh, the, the foreground, it looks rather normal-ish. Uh, but in the back there, it gets, it gets really cool. Uh, I grew up uh, playing video games in the 80s, so for me, it reminds me of Qbert. I don't know if you guys know Hubert or not, but this weird little guy who would hop around in these multi-level pyramidal structures. Um, it looks a lot like that. But very cool, Giant's Causeway. Again, I'm sure uh, in Ireland they have their own story behind this. But what it was at some point was a neck of a volcano. All right, so done with columnar jointing, and we're on to lava tubes. Lava tubes. People aren't the best gauge for scale. Well, I mean, we could assume that's an average-sized person. But again, people aren't really that helpful. Um, it could be a tourist in the way. It could be, you know, another geologist. They are wearing those awesome 80s geology <laughs> boots. Uh, but again, they sold them at Kmart's too, so you never know. Um, so that person is standing in a lava tube and staring at the wall. And that wall is a great example of technology and knowledge. Uh, we've talked about how all uh, through astronomy we look up at a star, we call it a star, and then somebody builds a better telescope and we realize, oh my gosh, that's two stars, okay. Uh, and then, you know, 100 years later, we realize there's actually three stars there, so we change. So I, again, have been using this slide. My volcano presentation is probably one of my oldest, unchanged. Um, so I've been using this since the days of overhead projectors, okay? And um, so I always talked about this line and how uh, lava tubes are, they have to be formed underwater, okay? That's just the way they work. 
Um, so what we're seeing here is probably some indication of, of tide uh, because, you know, you're worn away. We, we see this weathering and erosion in the tube, blah, 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 blah. That one semester we changed, I don't know if it was a better projector. It was in the digital era, I could tell you that. Um, but to what extent, what the reason was. At any rate, all of a sudden I realized that that was a ledge, not an indentation. In other words, you could set your cup of coffee on that thing. It wasn't, it always looked like it was cut under. And I'm like, oh crap, I have to change my story. Um, so yeah. More than likely, this was enhanced for tourists, okay? I'm not saying they went in there with dynamite or anything like that, but there was some digging out of this tunnel. Because what happens with a lava tube? Um, again, it, with every year, you guys get older, younger and younger, and you, my references are lost. But there was a screensaver back in the days of Windows PCs years ago that was this self-building network of pipes. It just was pipes, 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 pipes right? Um, and uh, this lava, as it flows and it hits the water, well, the outside instantly crystallizes, makes a pipe, a tube. But the inside is still molten. It keeps flowing. So as soon as it flows outside of that tube, it freezes. Then it flows, it freezes, and it builds this structure. Okay? Kind of like those paper yo-yos you get at little kids' parties. You fling them out, and they extend, and then they come back. Sort of the same idea. So this just flows and flows and flows, and then eventually the lava flow ends, depending on the viscosity, which is thickness or lack thereof. Um, it might flow through, it might just stay like half full. You get where I'm going with this? So I think that ledge is sort of a remnant of, of, of that aspect of this. Um, and it's awfully round, awfully round. So I, I do think there was some enhancement by the, the tourist agencies here. Uh, you can see the water on the ground. We are um, near some sort of shore. And, and through the tunnel there, it does look sort of uh, beachish a little bit. Now, this is the very beginning of a, a theme that's going to run for the rest of the semester, is that we use rocks um, as indicators of the past. Okay, it's, it's sort of a CSI kind of thing except we don't have people there to tell us the stories. We have to look at these silly rocks. And oftentimes they can tell you a whole lot more than, than you'd think at first glance at any rate. Um, because we know that really this is the only way you could form a lava tube. If this is halfway up a mountain right now, it, it probably isn't. But if it were, you would know one thing. You would, well, a couple things. You'd know there was volcanic activity there, obviously. But you would also know that there was a sizable amount of water at that point when that event happened. It was a shoreline of some sort. You'd go farther to see, was it fresh water, was it marine, does so on and so forth. So because we know that these only form in aquatic environments, that helps us reconstruct the scene of the crime, if you would, uh, just a little bit, a little bit more. So lava tubes. Speaking of stuff that only forms underwater, pillow basalts. What we're looking at here are those roughly beanbag-sized uh, balls of lava that uh, piled up on one another. This is sort of a, a lava jacuzzi, if you would. Um, you, if you've not ever been in a hot tub, surely you've seen one, and you know that there's these little air vents all around it, right? and that's what makes the bubbles. Well, it's the same idea here, but with air vent and um, lava. But here's the important thing, is enough water pressure to actually squeeze off these little balls and they roll off to the side. So you have to have a decent amount of water overhead uh, for this to happen. Otherwise, it's just gonna flow out, make a big old puddle, right, of lava. But in order for these things to form, you've got to have a decent amount of pressure, which comes from a decent amount of, of water. So now, not only do we know we're in an aquatic environment, but we know that we're potentially at a fairly deep aquatic environment. And you might be wondering, well, who the hell cares? And I get it. But there are some people who are in charge of 
stuff like this, and they, they, it's their job to care. Um, and more than likely, they cared whether it was their job or not, or they wouldn't be doing it. But uh, so again, if this guy happens to be halfway up a mountain, can't really tell in this picture. All right. Again, we do know then when these formed, which again, igneous rocks, especially uh, extrusive igneous rocks, are great to date, really accurate. We know that at that period of time, this area was underwater. Now, again, whether the water level was that high, which is an easy assumption to make, or we had uplift, which means this area was raised, again, you got to figure that out. Other ways, other times. But the rocks can tell us stuff. Okay? So, pillow basalts. What kind of rock are they? Basalt. Good. It's nice when they actually put the name of the thing in the thing, isn't it? Don't get used to that. It doesn't happen a whole lot. All right. Before we switch gears yet again, we're just going to call this one uh, quits here. Close enough to our time. But we're done with things you could make out of lava.